Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan, and today we're tackling something called autonomic dysreflexia. So as always, let's jump in with our practice question to get things started. The nurse is caring for a client experiencing autonomic dysreflexia. What action should the nurse perform first? We have A, administering sublingual nitroglycerin, B, elevating the head of the bed, C, obtaining a residual volume reading with a bladder scan, or D, performing a digital examination to assess for the presence of stool. So first, let's break down the anatomy as we always do. Remember, we will come back to that practice question. But to kick us off here, we've got to talk about the autonomic nervous system. This is basically your body's like autopilot. It handles things like heart rate, blood pressure, digestion, temperature regulation, things that you don't have to think about. So my brain remembers it autonomic, automatic. And the autonomic nervous system itself has two different sides, one that rears us up and one that slows us down. Sympathetic is that fight or flight that gets our body ready to go. And parasympathetic is rest and digest, that side that calms things down. So under normal conditions, these two systems work in harmony. They keep everything regulated. But when we have a spinal cord injury, specifically above the level of T6, the communication between the brain and the body can get a little scrambled. That is where autonomic dysreflexia comes into play. What happens is we get some sort of noxious stimuli. So most commonly, it's a full bladder. Maybe a catheter got kinked and urine's not draining out. Maybe it is like tight clothing or constipation or a draft, a breeze. Like really, it can be almost anything. But that stimuli triggers the sympathetic nervous system. It says fight or flight. We go into overdrive. It does that below the level of injury. So fight or flight below that level, we get vasoconstriction, blood pressure going up. The body is ready for battle. Now, the brain up above T6 has no way to control or shut down this response. It's the spinal cord that's injured. So it's like fire alarm blaring downstairs, but upstairs brain control panel disconnected. So the brain, that control panel, it tries to respond. It's like, okay, calm down, activate parasympathetic nervous system. Up top, we start slowing things down. Our heart rate goes down, we get bradycardia. But down below, fire alarm is still going off, vasoconstriction, severe hypertension. This also leads to a throbbing headache with that hypertension and the face getting really, really flushed. Up top will be sweaty, but down below where we're getting that vasoconstriction, cool, pale skin. So we've got this full-on tug-of-war situation and no ability to balance until we remove that underlying trigger. And to be clear, this really is a life-threatening condition. If we don't treat it quickly, we can get seizures, stroke, pulmonary edema. So very important to recognize and respond. How do we respond? Well, very quickly, we need to identify and remove that trigger. Like I said, the most common trigger is that full bladder. So check that catheter for any kinks. Make sure it is draining. Irrigate if it's needed. Put a new catheter or do a straight cath. That's one of the first things we're going to do. If it's not the bladder, check the bowels. Do we need to disimpact if there's an impaction? Remove some stool. Check the clothing. Is there anything tight? Any compression socks? We need to be checking the blood pressure every five minutes until we find that noxious stimuli and remove it. Okay, so recapping chain reaction situation here. We've got a trigger like bladder distension. It causes massive sympathetic nervous system stimulation below the injury, below T6. Okay, so fire alarm going off downstairs. And then upstairs, the brain trying to calm it down. It is activating the parasympathetic, rest and digest. But that control panel upstairs 
can't talk to downstairs because of that injury above T6. So upstairs, up top, bradycardia, down below, hypertension, causing that headache, flushing, all leading to a very big problem. So let's talk about how this actually shows up in a real client. The first time I truly saw autonomic dysreflexia in action was in the PICU. This was my bread and butter for years. And we had a 17-year-old girl who had suffered a spinal cord injury. Hers specifically was at T4. If I remember right, she was on the diving team and had taken a dive a little too shallow and ended up with a pretty severe spinal cord injury. For her, total loss of motor and sensory function below the level of injury. So we were managing her post-op and just, you know, getting her ready to go home to her new life in a wheelchair. She was really relatively stable on my shift. All of the immediate acute things had been taken care of. Why was she still in the PICU? Uh, There were no beds on the floor. She was really not a PICU patient anymore. She had totally been stabilized, but we didn't have any floor beds, so she was still in the PICU. But I had her on a day shift. I came in and like you could tell on her face something was wrong. It was just flush and hot. I asked if she was uncomfortable. She's like, no, I'm fine. But remember, below the level of injury, she can't feel anything. She has lost total motor and sensory function below that injury. So she's flushed. Face is nice and red. Feels hot. She's sweating on the forehead and neck. I feel her legs and they're pretty cool and clammy. First thing I do, go ahead and take her vitals. She wasn't hooked up on the monitor anymore since she was really a floor patient at this time. So we didn't have like continuous blood pressure like I'm used to in the ICU. But I check her blood pressure and it is sky high. It was like 180s over 110s. I really remember that diastolic because I had never seen one above that like 100 mark or so. And I was like, oh my gosh, shoot, we got a problem. But weirdly, I went ahead and got her up on the monitor at that point heart rate was in the 50s and that was not normal for her. So she's like a little agitated, kind of like moving around her upper body. And based on all of this info, I'm starting to think autonomic dysreflexia. So remember, T4 has an injury. We don't have communication between upstairs and downstairs. There is some sort of noxious stimuli causing irritation downstairs. So it is in sympathetic overdrive. It is like vasoconstricting and causing a major spike in blood pressure. But upstairs cannot talk to downstairs because of that injury. So the brain can't send signals to slow it down. It activates parasympathetic. It drives the bradycardia, the facial flushing, the sweating. It's just this tug of war back and forth that's going on. So Moving forward into action, you guys understand what it is. You know the symptoms that we're seeing in this client now. What did I do? First priority, sit her up, lower her legs. Doing this quick positioning makes all the difference. Here's what happens. It pulls blood away from the brain because we're sitting her up. That reduces cerebral perfusion pressure, and that helps decrease the risk of stroke, seizures, or a brain bleed, okay? The biggest thing I'm worried about is that sky-high blood pressure, honestly, causing like a hemorrhagic stroke, a brain bleed, leading to a seizure due to increased ICP. Those are the most intense complications, and I need to prioritize preventing them. So first thing, sit her up, lower her legs. Then I called for some help. Got the head of the bed up. Another nurse starts kind of looking around to see what could be causing this. We need to identify the noxious stimuli and get rid of that. So if I remember right, she had on like an abdominal binder. We removed that. We checked her indwelling catheter and ding, ding, ding. The tubing was kinked. So that's on me. I should have checked that prior and I missed it. So urine had not been draining from her bladder. As soon as we straightened it out, we got like half a liter of urine out within a few minutes. So her bladder was distended. That was the noxious stimuli that was sending off this surge of sympathetic nervous system activity below the level of injury. Once we emptied that bladder, her symptoms started to resolve. Blood pressure trended down. She said her headache eased up. She looked less flushed. In that case, we actually didn't even have to give antihypertensives like hydralazine. Now, 
if it hadn't have resolved really quickly, if that blood pressure had kept going up, we would have ended up giving that medication. But this is a great example of a simple positioning and like nursing intervention, avoiding the need for pharmacologic or ICU level interventions. We recognize the signs, sat her up, got that BP down, took care of the root cause of the problem, and it resolved. So really my takeaway for you guys is priority, sit them up right away, get that BP down. Then go and search for the noxious stimuli. Clothes, if they have a catheter, check the tubing, make sure it's not kinked. Do a straight cath if you need to. Check for a bowel impaction, tight socks, Ted hose, wrinkled sheets, ingrown toenails, a draft, like anything. In autonomic dysreflexia, it is about the cause. Find it and fix it, and it'll be over as fast as it started. So with that being said, let's us circle back now to our practice question and see if you guys can get to the right answer and why. So remember, we have a nurse caring for a client with autonomic dysreflexia, and we are wanting to know, what action do we perform first? A is administering sublingual nitroglycerin. B is elevating the head of the bed. C is getting a residual volume reading with a bladder scanner. And D is performing a digital rectal exam looking for stool. Okay, so think it through. A, B, C, or D, what do you do first? Say it out loud in your car, walking to class. It is B. We are sitting them up, elevating the head of the bed. The first thing you do is get that blood pressure down. This is reducing the risk of those really scary complications of a high blood pressure. Pressure in the brain gets too high. We can have a bleed, a stroke, seizures. We have to prevent that. Now, A, nitroglycerin, that is a very intense vasodilator that is going to reduce blood pressure. So could be appropriate, but it's not the first thing you do. Sitting them up first and then identify the cause. If that is taking a long time, if you're like, oh my gosh, what is causing this? Yeah, you're going to give that nitroglycerin. You're going to get their blood pressure down one way or the other, but it's not your go-to first because it's not the root cause of the problem. Now, C, bladder scanner. Okay, good idea, wrong order. You definitely got to assess the bladder. You got to see if they need catheterized, if that tubing is kinked, whatever. But the first thing you do is get them upright to prevent those dangerous complications. Then we start looking for the cause. Same thing with D, doing a DRE to look for impaction. Good idea, wrong order. You want to search for that cause after you've sat them up. That is the bottom line, guys. That is the key takeaway. In autonomic dysreflexia, it's about a stimulus triggering a runaway response. Your job is to lower that pressure and then hunt down what is causing it. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NFLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.